Hey, Jacqueline. Welcome to In Conversation. Great to have you on. It's great to be here, James. And um, I'm smiling because uh, for many years um, uh, in the Caribbean, in Jamaica specifically, I was part of something called In Conversation, where I interviewed um, mainly Jamaican and Caribbean women um, writers. So I find that very funny. <laughs> ah, know? awesome. I'm going to be interviewed on In Conversation. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess great minds and all that. <laughs> well, so your 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 in conversation, your version of it was was interviewing uh, female Jamaican artists and writers, yes, and writers, cool. and of, and of course, you are both a working artist and a Jamaican writer, right? I am both. I I oftentimes say that I am a writer, a visual artist, and a scholar. Well, I guess we're talking about the culmination of all three of those components um, of your background, really, because we're celebrating your new book, Patchwork, Essays and Interviews on Caribbean Visual Culture, which is uh, just published. And so, first of all, congratulations. It's a wonderful book. I've been fortunate to have had an early copy and to, to, to have read it last year. So I really did enjoy that. So congratulations. Thank you. I am so delighted that it's coming out from Intellect. Um, and will be distributed by um, Chicago here in the US. Um, I've admired Intellect's book. It was a thoroughly wonderful um, experience working with Intellect. Everybody loved the book from start to finish. Um, and I'm I, I think it turned into a really beautiful book. So I'm very happy about that. Oh, wonderful. Well, and, and we're, we're so proud of the project and uh, for our small part in delivering it. Um, and I do urge people who are watching us today to visit intellectbooks.com and uh, take a look at the book. Um, it's wonderful, wonderful images and uh, wonderful writing. Um, but why don't you tell us a little bit more about the project? How did it first come about for you? Um, the book, as so many of my projects come about, um, I, I didn't think I was putting together a book um, at the time. Uh, it it had its genesis years and years ago, but at the time it wasn't really a book. It was really um, me wanting to understand the Caribbean as a visual culture space. Um, years and years ago when I was a grad student, I'm a grad student again actually, <laughs> I, I am doing my PhD, but when I was doing my master's degree years and years ago, and that's in creative writing, um, I stumbled in a course that was being taught by um, Edward Sullivan, wonderful, wonderful man, um, art historian of Latin American and Caribbean art, still at NYU. And at the same time, I was um, developing um, and editing a journal called Calabash, a journal of Caribbean arts and letters. And as I stumbled into Ed Sullivan's class on um, Caribbean art, the it seemed like the world opened up for me. Mm. And so I integrated um, Caribbean art into that journal. And one thing that I did was I started interviewing um, visual artists from the Caribbean and never really stopped interviewing them. Um, and got a small grant from NYU through Edwards Doing, and went to the Caribbean and was conducting these oral history interviews with um, mainly untutored, untrained artists in Jamaica. And I've been doing this for decades now, just talking to artists. And, you know, the culmination of all of that is, um, is the book Patchwork that uh, Intellect published. And just for people who, who aren't aware of it, so it's basically essays and interviews with contemporary Caribbean writers, scholars and curators. Um, and it sounds like you uh, you sort of undertook that work over a, a, a large period of time. Um, do you want to maybe just highlight a little, just tell us a little bit about some of the, the artists and the writers who you actually interviewed over that period? Um, one of the, uh, the standout components of Patchwork for me 
um, is that it seeks to integrate um, vernacular textile workers okay. along with trained artists from the Caribbean. And that's very um, important for me. Uh, on the cover of um, the book, I was honored to have on it my great grandmother holding up her patchwork that she um, made. And um, interestingly enough, my PhD now looks at Jamaican women's decorative and ornamental textile traditions, which um, there's about four or five of us now doing PhDs or just finished PhDs looking at these traditions, but it had never been looked at before. And so in the book, I talk a little bit about trying to integrate these women, these um, vernacular traditions, saying me, donkey, my grandmother, um, my great grandmother, um, into this wonderful ca canon of uh, Caribbean works. Um, and so that's very important. Um, the last time I checked, this has never happened to me before. Um, 34,000 people went to look at this. <laughs> on um, uh, Twitter, um, and I'm like, whoa, <laughs> you know, um, I hope all of them buy the book. <laughs> well, yeah, me and you both. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, but that's that's like, I mean, we, we measure a book success, obviously, through sales and then through, you know, being an academic publisher through academic impact. But also what's, you know, there's sometimes imperceivable is impact beyond the academy and i think that's one of the real strengths of this book and one of the real values of the work that you've created um and to me and to my knowledge it seems like these traditions are you know are largely to a broader audience sort of unknown and and many of these characters and many of these really important vernacular artists needle workers and and classically trained artists too from the caribbean are, uh you know are really kind of unknown so it's kind of a really good opportunity, I think, to highlight the work of, of some of those artists. Who are some of the, the key figures in the book? That I know you've mentioned a couple, including your grandmother, of course, but who are some of the people that we may have heard of or that we really should know about? Um, well, thank you for what you just said. Um, this, th that's, that's very meaningful. It's, it's, it's very meaningful. It's, it's very meaningful for me. And it's very meaningful for some of the people who have passed on, such as Saint Mae Dunkley, who um, right at the moment that she was supposed to leave Jamaica with her work, she died, you know? Yeah. Um, and so um, I, I, I really appreciate that. Some of the people in the book, part, you know, are very well known. So um, uh, Sheena Rose, for example, make, in Barbados, she's very well known. She's a wonderful artist and a wonderful person, you know? So I start the book with Wendy Nanan. Um, out of Trinidad, for example, who has always been known in Trinidad, but seems to be getting a larger audience now. Um, and I'm very excited for Wendy Nanan, for example. She's an, uh, an older artist who continues to work. And she talked, an, an Indian Trinidadian woman who talks about the difficulties um, that she went through in you know, at the time that she start, she came of age and was making work, and people couldn't understand why she would want to do this right. <laughs> um, as a young Indian woman. Um, and so I, I felt it was um, it was important to start the book with her. Um, uh, Jody Lynn Ki Chow, for example, in in Jamaica and the work that she's doing. Um, I think is very, very important. There are people such as um, Earl Mackenzie, um, who has been painting for years in Jamaica, years and years and years. And uh, no one pays much attention to him and his work. Um, and I, I wish he was taken a little bit more seriously than he is, he's an older gentleman. Um, and he gets up every day and he paints for hours and hours and hours. And he did a series of work that I think is some of his best work in which he painted the poets of Jamaica. Oh, cool. And he himself is a, both a painter and a poet and a philosopher as well. Um, so there's just 
the book is just rich with a lot of people who are very, very well known, but a lot of people who I believe have been overlooked in the, the Caribbean as well. And if, if, for example, other, other than obviously reading and buying your book, if people are interested in finding out more about this rich tradition of Caribbean art um, and writing, of course, as well, are there any good resources they could they could look to? Uh, or I mean, I know well, obviously with regard to the book, a lot of it is is first hand primary sources of you actually interviewing these 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 characters and these individuals. But um, are there any other resources you could draw people's attention to, like is like the I don't know National Gallery of Jamaica or anything like that? Are there any are there any good good resources? Um, several of the Caribbean islands have national galleries, um, and uh, some, several of these national galleries have produced um, uh, uh, definitive uh, works on artists from those countries. I happen to find that problematic, <laughs> you know? Um, um, so, for example, uh, the story that has been produced about Jamaican art is of Edna Manley coming from England in the 1920s and starting art in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. I say art started with the enslaved coming to Jamaica, bringing their traditions from uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, scratch that. I say art started with the indigenous populations that were on these islands and then the enslaved came and added to those traditions and the Europeans added to those traditions as well. Um, um, and Edna Manley is among the artists that added to our traditions. It did not start with her. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's a lot of rethinking that has to go on in these official histories that come from the uh, places like the National Gallery of Jamaica. And I say this with great respect and love for institutions such as the National Gallery of Jamaica. Um, I must say, um, since this book comes from uh, uh, a European publication, um, from Intellect, um, that there's great work, fantastic work going on in the UK in rethinking these histories, right? And so I am at the University of Leeds and I'm very happy. <laughs> to be doing my PhD at the University of Leeds, right? Um, because, and I've, I found a, a, a very, um, a willingness to help me think through the issues that I'm thinking through, looking at patchwork, you know, as being foundational to what I consider Jamaican art, you know? Uh, which uh, is not what is in the official history of Jamaican art, right? Yeah. Um, so I would say so there are institutions in places like the United Kingdom that are doing really great work, right? So. I mean, that, I think that's one of the really important things. And, and as a European and a, a British publishing company, although we were founded by Iranian scholars, we, we've always been a, a British publishing company, but with a very much an international remit, um, an international audience. And of course, we're publishing the work of scholars from all over the world. But in recent years, one of the things that we've really been focusing on is this idea of reclaiming, you know, uh, de deconstructing and decolonializing like content and providing space for people to provide alternative histories, truthful histories, or their own histories. Um, and I feel like this book is 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 definitely doing that. I think we have other books like Reclaiming Ballet um, by Adeshola Kinle, which is a, a wonderful book again, which is trying to decolonize the ballet and the myth that it's, uh, you know, more of a European white kind of discipline when there's actually this entire other history that people just aren't aware of. And was that important to you with your work and, and with this book? Are you trying to sort of decolonize um, the traditions or are you just presenting an alternative that, like, like we said at the start, that people just simply aren't uh, aware of because of the nature of like, the, the hegemony and history? Uh, I think I'm trying to do both things okay. at the same time. Um, and I, I, I want to just say, um, because someone just sent me uh, a copy of uh, Prince Harry's Spare, which I haven't had a time to look at 
um, very closely mm -hmm. um, that I don't want to make it out that the UK is this model of <laughs> all things wonderful and the colonial. Um, and we only have to look at the reception of his book um, to see how uh, grotesque things remain in some places in the UK. <laughs> very much so, yeah, very much so. <laughs> Um, and as he tries to get an institution like the monarchy, for example, to examine itself, which it, in, to my eyes, refuses to do, um, we, 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 we see how it can, it, it, you know, the pushback towards that. Uh, that said, <laughs> right, um, um, I do believe that um, my impetus um, in, in, in putting together patchwork was both decolonial and um, also bringing forward new narratives, new stories, new histories. Um, and um, and I, I, I have to say that intellect was very um, supportive of the impetus of both um, both things that I was trying to do. Um, so I think that even as the UK struggles with race and racism, there are uh, pockets within it that is trying to deal with an ugly legacy and an ugly history is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Thank you. No, really, really important comments. Um, and I think, I mean, I'm, I, I'm, no, I'm certainly no expert, but I, I think the UK is an interesting case. And having read books recently um, by people like Akala, where they're investigating the intersections between race and class in the Caribbean and also in post-Empire Britain, I find these to be really interesting and often very useful discussions. Um, and you know, I'm based in America now. I know you're, you're, you've lived in London and you're, you're also based in between Miami and New York. And rich Caribbean traditions in both the UK and of course in America, especially in Miami in its own ways. And then of course, New York with more of a Jamaican, more of a Caribbean like culture that's sort of transplanted there. And, uh, and, 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 and I think that there's but, but sort of both countries are struggling with very different issues. And one of the key things I think that the UK is trying to do, but has a long way to go still is to, to educate itself about its own empirical past, its own empire. Uh, you know, and 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 rather than just brushing it under the, it's it's a bit like our version of slavery in the sense that it's. I know it was obviously entwined with that, but historically it just hasn't been discussed, or people are not educated about it within primary education and with formative education. So there's just a complete misunderstanding of its impacts. Um, and then of course that means that we we don't necessarily always celebrate the the positive sides of those cultural intersections as well, which of course have led to the wonderful dynamic culture that we have in places like New York, London, Bristol, you know, et cetera. Um, so yeah, just, just a comment really, just to say, I think that's really important. And obviously this book is also coming out around the time of Black History Month as it's being celebrated, especially um, among African-American culture in the United States, but also it's, it's of course being celebrated in the UK too. So I, I don't know, yeah, is there, do you have any, any, any comments about that or? or... I do. Um... I, I lived in the UK for um, three years, three or four years. Um, I only recently came back and it was an interesting experience for someone who is both Jamaican and American, <laughs> right? Because on the one hand, um, I felt very at home in the UK. The Jamaican part of me was like, I recognize everything here. Yeah. They talk like I do. The streets are named after every street I've, I know in Jamaica, right? People drink tea, all of the things that I, I know. The American, Brixton is my favorite place ever, <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, and, and, and what shocked me about Brixton, what completely floored me about Brixton and why I could live there is that I could find Naysberries, June mm. palms, all the things that yeah. I couldn't find in New York, um, I could find in Brixton. Yeah. And I thought, well, how can that be? I mean, New York is closer than Brixton would, Brixton is further away, right? 
the intersections of Caribbean life in the UK are more inter intersected, intertwined, richer, yeah. right, in um, the UK than they are in America, which is I, I agree. Right. Uh, when I'm doing research, it just it, it just it, it's a it's a, it's a um, it just builds on itself, mm. you know, um, and which is why I would I had to do my PhD there, you mm. know, um, because the 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 archives have everything that I was looking for. You know, um, trying to do the PhD in the US would have meant I would be going to the archives in the UK all the time yeah. anyway. Right? Yeah. I think you're right. I think you're right. However, the American part of me rebelled because in America, there was a, a clearer understanding of race. <laughs> right? Yeah. And so in the UK, there was a, always a, well, we don't have your American racial problems and we don't, you know, and there was a dismissal and disavowal of race that was very clear to me in the UK. Yeah. It was very clear, <laughs> right? And until there is an understanding and a reckoning of race um, um, in the UK, there's just still so much to be done, was my, is my feeling on the matter. I, right. I think that's such an such an important point. Yeah. So it was interesting for me being both Jamaican and American living there, um, because I, it's almost as though I was having uh, uh, um, reacting to the place through a kind of double, triple consciousness, you know. And there's still so much that I miss about the UK. You know, I, there, there is much that I miss about it. Uh, the UK has the best television in the world. There was no, um, there is no feeling like curling up and watching Vera, Midsummer Murder. Um, I, I would always say to people, uh, the watching UK television is like going to the movies every night. That's what it felt like. It's, it's like going to the movies every night. Right, I'm not a fan of UK food, um, <laughs> though they do make the best fish and chips, and I miss that. <laughs> you know, yeah, me, me and you both, yeah. <laughs> um, so, and but if you went to Brixton, you got the best Caribbean food ever, right? So it 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 was it was it was such an experience. It was such a full experience i i it, it it's hard to put it into um it's hard to conceptualize it but it was a it was a full experience i <laughs> wouldn't mind having again <laughs> well i know i know you're a a, a a a big lover of brixton market or were a big big lover of brixton market so for anyone out there who maybe hasn't had the opportunity to experience the wonders of brixton or brixton market or or other caribbean neighborhoods in london or, or elsewhere if they were going to go there, is there any particular cuisine or anything that you would recommend they try to get like a real kind of flavor for like that Caribbean culinary, the culinary arts? Um, <clears throat> oh, why am I, why am I blacking on the, the one that I always, there's always a line outside of it. Um, it was a Jamaican restaurant. I can't remember the name right now, but I can see it right in front of my eyes. Well, what, what should they What should they order if they were to uh, enter, If they were going to go to a good Caribbean? Everything restaurant? there <laughs> was good, and the line there were, you couldn't sit you couldn't sit down. You see, and it yeah. was open yeah. twenty four hours. And I, when I moved out of the neighborhood to where I was, I, you know, I was working for NYU, so they moved me closer to the university. I would just pack up everything, you know. But I have to say, just even walking through B Brixton Market was a, a marvelous experience for me. Yeah. Um, and I could get everything Caribbean there. And I would I, I, just walking through Brixton Market is everything to me, you know. Um, now I'm so nostalgic for walking through <laughs> Brixton Market, you know. I, I, I. There were there were Caribbean flowers being sold that I would buy every second week or something like that. So um, I really love I really love Brixton. 
I really love Brixton. Well, well, moving on and getting back to the book. Yeah. Let, um, let's talk talk a little bit more about what you mean by these vernacular traditions, this vernacular needlework. Um, yeah, what, what's that all about, and 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 how 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 are these traditions passed on? These traditions um, are largely, for the most part, um, Afro Jamaican and Afro Caribbean traditions. The interesting thing to me, and they're passed on usually mother to daughter, woman to woman. The interesting thing to me is that you can have a place like National Galleries or the National Gallery of Jamaica, which has never shown this or it has never been written about before, right? Um, and so you have patchworks, right? And you have map making, you know? and uh now um that I, i'm i'm writing a whole chapter about this and we have you even have traditions that are not african necessarily um like embroidery um that itself anything having to do with hand handwork did not necessarily make it into a place like the national gallery of jamaica right uh, the interesting thing to me about it, because I'm writing this right now and I'm having a lot of fun writing about it, is that my supervisor said, um, when I showed them a first draft, they said, well, where's the place of Africa in all of this? And they wanted me to answer that specific question, where is Africa in this? Because I was showing them embroidery in the 1600s that were in Jamaica, gorgeous embroidery in Port Royal, which, you know, at one point was the, the you know, it was a very famous place in Jamaica. Um, and in trying to answer the question of where is Africa, I found all this, um, all these traditions that were rooted in the land. And, um, you know, just uh, natural plants, flowers, patchwork, um, map making, and so forth and so on, gorgeous things. And I've even found in the archives in the UK uh, where, uh, let's say, an embroidery uh, during the period of slavery would be offered to somewhere like the VNA, mm. but an African piece would be offered as well that was declined for being too rough you know oh. or something like that um and that was turned away so you see where the you see moments of actual invisibility when this happens and to try to um obviate this invisibility you're you're asking these beautiful questions james james beautiful questions thank you for them um i have myself started to put pull together an archive which is like 400 pieces strong um and some of it is in this book as well um you, by the way i i want to shout out the paul mellon foundation in uh london that gave us the grant to have these beautiful pictures uh not only of these pieces but of all of all the pieces in the book that we were able to feature so thank you paul mellon foundation um so but back to your question um and so <clears throat> we I, I i was able to pull together that but then in the book i was able to showcase some of these traditions um and so the overarching question is these traditions remain they're there but what have we never heard of them before yeah. you know this is this is this is one of the main contributions of this book, um, for which I thank Intellect, for which I thank the Paul Mellon Foundation, and I think it's because it's untrained women. Uh, well, I wouldn't even say they're untrained because they they're training each other. <laughs> you know, they're passing these traditions down. Um, but I would say it's because. Uh, Places like my beloved National Gallery of Jamaica that I love so much have very specific ideas of what is art. Yeah. And this is this doesn't cut it, you know? And so it's not considered art. Well, I think again, that's why this book is such a vital contribution to arts globally. Um, and that concept of of invisibility that you, you know, mentioned there, I think again is is really important to this. 
um, along with sort of deconstructing that history of conquest and empire and how those themes are shown within some of the works themselves. Um, thinking of themes, though, you also mentioned the land um, a minute ago. And it seems to me with my untrained eye that ecology and sustainability are a major concern for contemporary Caribbean artists. And I think that comes from that, potentially from some of that comes from that vernacular tradition. Um, what are your thoughts on that? And do you see sustainability and, and eco arts or, you know, that, those kind of things sh showcasing through this type of art that you've been analyzing and the artists and writers you've been interviewing? Wonderful question. Wonderful, wonderful question. You have read this book and you've been thinking about this book. And I want to thank you for that. Uh, because you said something that is, um, uh, I, I just want to reiterate what you said. Uh, what, what I heard you say is that um, uh, ecology um, and sustainability is a theme in this book. Yes, I agree. Uh, there are several uh, notable Jamaican artists and Caribbean artists who take up the theme. I'm thinking specifically of the Puerto Rican artist Lionel Cruet, um, but there are also Jamaican artists as well who um, work on this theme. Um, but what made me smile um, was that you said this theme was being pulled upon um, by uh, vernacular artists. Now, this is so true. <laughs> This is so true, right? Uh, because if you look at the doilies that were being made in the 1800s, or if you look at the work that enslaved women were making, or if you look at the work that uh, the Maroon communities were making under the period of slavery, it was work that was coming from the environment. Mm. You know, lace bark from a tree, for example, that are in so many institutions in the UK and in the US. These were natural um, uh, products from the Caribbean. So that tradition of, and I, I, I personally do not know of anyone who has done any work on this. So that tradition of um, sustainability and uh, the environment linking that to um, the vernacular traditions coming from slavery, I think that's key. And I think that's very important. And I, I really thank you for making that link. I think that's uh, um, a clear link to anyone who, who reads the, the book, which again is excellent. And I really urge people to, 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 to read it and they'll find all this out for themselves. Um, but thanks for explaining that and unpacking that a little bit, because I think it's a really important part of the uh, the book that links lots of different components together. Um, just thinking as well, more generally, who who were some of your influences? Who influenced you, and and how did you end up writing this book? You know, how did you end up where you are, and and who were some of the influences on your life? Well, you know, I um. I grew up uh, with a lot of women and a lot of strong women, <laughs> you know. Um, the, uh, I remember as a child being raised by my grandmother. Mm -hmm. um, and I lived with my grandmother for a long time and um, until she went back to the countryside, you know. She went back to a small district called Nonsuch, which, uh, which is in Portland. Um, which of course got its name from where? Nonsuch in um, uh, just outside London, <laughs> right? Okay. Um, and so um, the, the first face I remember is my grandmother's face. And I was very, very, very close to my grandmother. And in fact, um, still have patchworks in my collection that my grandmother made, you know? And remember her making me when I, passed my what was then the common entrance a wonderful um apron that i needed for school and so i was very close to my grandmother um and then it was my mother and my mother was an active political worker she worked a lot for what would you know be the liberal party jamaica the people's national party um, she crocheted a lot, <laughs> you know, that was her art form. 
Uh, both of them had been raised by my great grandmother who made the most fantastic patchworks. And um, as I was writing this chapter, I remember too that she worked with lace bark, which is a natural kind of lace that grew in Jamaica that even enslaved women use. Um, very, very close to my father, you know. Um, he's probably, he's one of my best friends even to, today, you know. Um, and so uh, that, that was the community, that, 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 that was the family, you know. I grew up among women who labored, worked hard. My, my, my great-grandmother uh, was a market woman. And uh, thanks to the Paul Mellon Foundation, did a whole series on the market woman, who is the bedrock foundation of the Caribbean society. <laughs> no one has done much work on her either. Yeah. So she is on everything about the Caribbean. She is the face of the Caribbean. And my great grandmother's, <laughs> don't make me cry now, my great grandmother's dream uh, for my grandmother was that she wouldn't be in the field. And so when she went off and she became a housekeeper, that was a big thing. And my grandmother's dream for my mother was that she would be an office worker and she became a secretary. Now she's a school teacher. Mm. And my grandma, my, my mother went on to get even a master's degree and she wanted her kid, her daughter to be um, a college graduate and I'm getting a PhD, you know? So, uh, so you see the trajectory, so. Um, and, the, and the power of matriarchy, you know? And Yeah, yeah, you know. Um, and I feel like in so many ways, I'm honoring these women, you know? And not just these women, but so many unseen women who, you know, this is why the vernacular tradition is so important to me. Uh, I, I mean, I, I, I completely agree with you. And that's just like a wonderful personal narrative, which I think really encapsulates some of the, you know, what the book's about and why it's so powerful. Um, and I think anyone who reads it will, will certainly feel that and, and, and hear the, those traditions coming through. Do you have any final thoughts or anything else you'd like to highlight about the book? Or maybe tell us a little bit about what you're, uh, you're currently working on? Um... Uh, I I am very close to tears. Your 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 question just brought me very close to tears. Um, huh. let me take a second here and yeah. get myself together. Um, I'm going to be in the ceramics biennial again this year. Um, so I'm I'm working a lot on that. Um, uh, uh I'm also working on. Uh, my dissertation a lot. Um, <laughs> busy, busy. <laughs> I'm a very busy girl. Um, I think just to interrupt you very quickly, I, I did. I should just say as well to our listeners out there that you're a very gifted artist and a celebrated one in your own right. And I would just urge people as well to just Google you um, and you have your own website and there's a lot of content and a lot of your artwork available online for people to peruse and browse. And I think again, that you can see the impact of these traditions of your own, you know, the, matri the matriarchy that you've been in part of and these vernacular histories and traditions that have been passed down. You can see that in your own work as well. I think if people have a look at the artwork um, before they read the book or, or in collaboration, they'll really kind of get a feel for what you're about and, 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 and for the culture behind it as well. Yeah. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm very focused on those things. Um, I, I am surprised at how deep I went talking about the women <laughs> um, uh, or how deep you got me to go. <laughs> And so those are the things that I'm working on. Um, I'll be spending a lot of time talking about these bo this book to others. Um, so that's what I'm doing. Well, Jacqueline, thank you very much for your time. It's been wonderful having you as a guest today. And I've really enjoyed sort of unpacking some of the themes um, in the book, which is now available. And just to remind everyone, the book is titled Patchwork, Essays and Interviews on Caribbean Visual Culture. Um, I very much enjoyed it. It's a wonderful read and it's coming out 
um, at the same time that we're celebrating Black History Month as well. And I think you've done a really wonderful job of celebrating many previously invisible artists and rendering their work vividly for other people through these interviews and discussions. So massive congratulations to you. And on behalf of Intellect, we're really proud and happy that you chose to work with us on this project. Um, yeah, thank you very much. And thanks again for, for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me, <laughs> even though you made me cry. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the power of the work and the power of the traditions we're discussing. <laughs> All right. Bye bye. Thank you very much.